It's the Hidden History Happy Hour, and you are back. Alex, welcome back. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. I have had a little bit of a of a momentous week because one of my favorite subjects, as you know, unidentified flying objects, flying saucers, UAPs, are back in the news, which we're going to oh, talk gosh, about in a minute. Oh, gosh, yes. You had congressional evidence about it, didn't you? We did, and we had whistleblowers who have sworn under oath in front of the United States Congress that <laughs> the United States is holding biologic remains that are not of this planet. And uh, it's a thing. And I'm kind of proud of my grandparents for uh, pointing this out 70 years ago. And there's a British angle to this story we'll get to in a minute. But Alex, you know what UFOs typically don't have? Tell me. Wings. Ah, good intro to the story I wanted to tell today. I didn't even see it coming. That's embarrassing. Uh, so it's, the story is called Flying Without Wings. Um, May 1957, the U.S. Uh, Marine Fighter Squadron issued with F-8 Crusaders, which was the first time that your uh, Marines had their own supersonic fighter jets. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel, as he would be to me, Lieutenant Colonel to you, William Rankin, um, who was a veteran of both the Second World War and the Korean War, uh, was in command of that unit. And he and um, colleague... Uh, Lieutenant Nolan took two of these uh, F-8s up on a training flight and they were flying out of Massachusetts um, to South Carolina on what was meant to be a routine flight. I stress meant to be. Everything's fine at first. Um, Rankin's jet was above a thunderstorm at 47,000 feet, which actually I think was the same height as the um, mushroom cloud we discussed in the last episode from Very close. the first yeah. nuclear test. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so he was flying at 40, 47,000 feet, uh, which is high, and he was flying at Mach 0.82. That is to say, he's approaching the speed of sound when the problems begin and settle in for the list of problems because I think what I'm going to describe here was probably the worst day an aviator has endured and survived. So this recital is quite the list. His engine made a loud thumping sound, uh, which is not good in a jet, and then it stopped. The uh, fire warning light came on. That's a bad combination. And the F-8 was equipped with an emergency generator turbine. And let's yeah, start it up again. He pulled the handle to start that up again, and the handle snapped off in his hand, and all of the instrumentation in the cockpit stopped working, went dead. His plane was effectively now a coffin. Um, Rankin was not wearing a pressure suit, but at 47,000 feet, going at Mach 0.82, or perhaps it had slowed down very slightly as the engine had stopped, but you know, momentum is all, um, he ejected from oh. the dead plane. Now, he could never be sure, he never claimed he could answer this, but with the speed with which those things unfolded, he doesn't know whether this is true or not. The injuries on his body suggest that the canopy failed to open and the ejection process punched him through the canopy oh. rather than out into the open air. He was nine miles above the ground. So the external temperature at that altitude and in those conditions was minus 50 degrees centigrade. Um, you'll have to tell me what that is in Fahrenheit. I don't know. It was minus 50 it's degrees. It's fucking C. cold is what it is. Yeah, th that, yeah, that's a minus. And he was moving at several hundred miles an hour without pro um, protection. And that renders the temperature that his body experienced considerably colder than minus 50 degrees C because yeah, yeah. he's, he's hurtling at several hundred miles an hour. So he, he punches through the canopy probably, and he suffers immediate frostbite, especially on the parts of his body like his face, his ankles, his wrists, that were directly exposed as bare skin to the elements in, at that height and at that speed. And the decompression he experienced immediately caused bleeding from the eyes, ears, mouth, and nose. Uh, he's, he was wearing a helmet, and that helmet had a visor, but it was promptly blown off in that explosive force. So his vision, I mean, forget the blood on his eyeballs for a moment, um, his vision was further impaired. And uh, sorry to tell you this, his gut swelled up like a balloon because of the, the um, compressive effect. He did, this is the one thing in his favor, have an emergency oxygen supply. But I'm afraid it gets worse. He was trapped above the storm, and then he was in it. Tossed and thrown by the wind, he was in the air a full five minutes, sometimes rising, sometimes plunging, before his parachute, which had an automatic system, prematurely opened. Designed to open at only 10,000 feet, the storm affected the mechanism in it and just 
triggered it to go off. And then after the five minutes of being buffeted around, he started moving much more quickly. Updrafts would throw him a mile up, would throw him high. There's a way to hit the parachute, right? Correct. Yeah. Would take him down, take him up, thousands of feet at a time, up, down. Inevitably, he vomited a lot. And lightning bolts were being flung towards the earth around him, all around him. And the thunder, of course, was deafening. He was being pummeled by hailstones as big as fists. And of course, the decompression at that altitude without a suit was incredibly painful. Um, so the stresses and strains upon his body um, as he was pulled every which way by the harness of the parachute were immense. And throughout this process, he remained conscious. He endured this once the parachute had opened for 40 minutes yeah. in the storm. Now, it was not his first forced parachute drop. He had, uh, the, uh, your pilots have an expression for this, he'd ridden the risers before he'd done so in Korea. Yeah. But this was worse than he or indeed anyone else to come back to, to talk about. He says he didn't just hear the thunder, he could feel the thunder. Blades of lightning going past him looked to him several feet wide. One bolt lit up the canopy of his parachute in brilliant blue and Rankin, quite understandably in my view, thought that he had died. Um, but then his descent began. He had to hold his breath through torrential rain because as when he hit it at 30,000 feet, the notion of drowning five miles above the earth would have seemed a pretty cruel conclusion to his experience. So he had to hold his breath for this enormous drop through um, solid water. Sorry, didn't he, I thought you said he had an oxygen supply. Yeah, he had a he had a partial oxygen supply, but he's been up there now for more than forty minutes. Uh, you know, it's, um, and he has to float down, down, down to a landing that must have been the most welcome of all time. And of course, he was a man who knew the area and his conditions. He had feared that he, if he got through this, the swamps below in Carolina in the Carolinas would kill him. After all, he'd endured. But very fortunately, and through you know, no control of his own, he touched down in a forest in North Carolina. Point is, he lived to tell the tale. He required immense treatment in hospital, as you'd expect. Um, and the book title, he was always keen to stress, his publisher's not his own. The Man Who Rode the Thunder um, tells his story. And there is a lesson from my story. And the lesson is this. The next time you're cursing work and thinking you're having a tricky old day, Imagine what it must have been like to have been nine miles above the earth, tossed among lightning bolts in a huge seething storm, bleeding from everywhere imaginable in your body, kept there for the better part of an hour. And then the only man to have survived to this day, falling through a thunderstorm, returning to work after your wounds have healed because it is your duty. So, you know, to us, a severe weather warning is a phrase we hear on TV or the radio. And perhaps, you know, we nod, perhaps we, we ignore it. Hi-ho. For the brave men and women flying fighter jets today, it is rather different. And he did go back to flying. He went back to work. Amazing. Amazing. Well, cheers to him. Cheers. The, now, um, um, I, it's a brave guy, but you've intrigued me. Um, if you got, have you got any anything on, on that? I want to talk to you about those, but... Uh, yeah, the only point I wanted to briefly discuss about that story is I don't know what the Marines did with him after that, but uh, one really, really good, valuable use of his time, which as a combat pilot he would have hated, but I think would have been really valuable, would for him been for him to just go around and tell his story. Teaching, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we we had a um we I don't know if we've told the story yet of the guy who um was thrown out of his um exploding Spitfire and escaped back to the UK, but he taught escaping so. for the rest of the war. Yeah. And yeah. um, you know, probably the, hated it, but yeah, yeah, I'm sure. But there's nothing like the guy who's had the real experience to yeah. to tell you the story and keep yeah. you spellbound and and te you learn far more from that than than you might from a textbook. So well, so, the Marines are point. um the Marines are uh you know, have been around as long as my country and they have um, endured incredible amounts of hardship uh, for us. So um, 
So cheers to him. Cheers, cheers to the United States Marine Corps. Yeah. So I can't help but ask Alex, uh, particularly given you know all of my personal history with UFOs and the way the show has talked about UFOs, about a story that I saw a couple weeks ago um, about King Charles. Same things happening in my country. King Charles being under pressure to call on the government to release more information about UFOs. But here's the, there's two twists to the British version of the story that aren't true here. One is, of course, you have a king who, you know, may or may not have moral suasion over the government. You could if you want to. You, you're always welcome to come uh, home. <laughs> hey, talk to me in uh, January of 25. I might be there. Um, but secondly, uh, unlike the discussion in my country, the story I read said that part of the pressure on him to release this information is in order to, and now I'm quoting, help Britain prepare for the country's first contact with aliens. So do you guys know something we don't? I mean, you had the Foo Fighters. We've talked about them on the show. You were ahead of us on UFOs. Is King Charles sitting on something or what? I doubt it very much. Um, I've always loved the idea that there's a vast conspiracy able to be much more competent than any other branch of government has dem demonstrated itself to be <laughs> hitherto um, in keeping these facts from us. In fact, the, uh, you know, I have to think about, well, maybe the Singaporean government, but <laughs> I don't think the rest of us have got the ability to hold uh, hold things together. I mean, maybe in its more authoritarian periods, Israel. But, you know, I, there aren't that many countries that have a government small enough, trust-based enough, and tight-lipped enough um, to keep these things a secret, let alone... I mean, the temptation to say to somebody in pillow talk, my God, darling, you wouldn't believe what I know. Um, and, and then that gets out. I just... I, I, I think purely statistically, given the number of galaxies there are in the universe, and we're discovering new galaxies all the time. Yeah, yeah. Not new stars, not new planets, new galaxies are being discovered yeah. by um, telescopes. The, the sheer number of galaxies that there are in the universe, the notion that we are alone as intelligent life in the universe, for me, seems statistically absurd to the point of um, be, being indefensible. But the equally, the idea, given the immense gaps in distances in space and so forth the idea that they have come to earth is not a sure thing and the idea that, that we know about it and have it have hidden it somehow i think seems rather silly but what i'm interested what i wanted to ask you about your um biological material did was the suggestion in those hearings that it had come on meteorites or that it was the origin of it unexplained well, it was vague. And a lot of times the witnesses said, you know, we can talk about more about X, Y, or Z in classified session. But the clear, so there were three witnesses. Two were pretty buttoned down, you know, military scientists saying, yeah, there's stuff we can't explain, but we're skeptics. And the third guy was just, he was all in. He was, you know, I don't know if he actually said we have like the Will Smith corpse of an alien being hauled across the desert to Area 51, but it's pretty close to that. And he's the one that was asked the question, uh, is the United States government in possession of non-terrestrial biologics? And he said, yes, absolutely. But I don't want to talk about that more in public session. So good point. Like, could it have been an obscure piece of mold that was on a, a meteorite? I don't know. But he was certainly well, implying there was more to it. We are, um, you yeah, know, I, I read recently, um, I should have thought about, I didn't know we were going to talk about talk aliens, but I read recently about um, stones that were found that are, uh, that supposedly very you know, perfect round shapes that were um, much older than either the earth or the area yeah. of the earth they were found in. Um, and I can accept that those things may, you know, be, have been flung out from the heavens and survive embedded after an impact. But I would imagine we're going to get some kind of material, hopefully, back from Mars when um, the rover uh, missions can um, deliver some of the stuff that they've found. The trouble is, of course, if there is evidence of something that that finds, then it points in one direction. And if there is no evidence of, of, of that having biological or other material, people will just say you found the wrong rock. So, you know, right. you, it's, people will <laughs> it's never believe the, yeah. the negative. Um, well, to that point, um, I probably have done this before on our show but you know we got a lot of new fans so i'm gonna at the risk of being repetitive 
remind everybody about the experience I had on the night before the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. So November 21st, 2013, I was giving a speech in, uh, in Minnesota at the university of Minnesota. And then there was a panel discussion afterwards. And the, the whole point of the panel discussion was the CIA and classification of information and declassification of public's right to know and all that. And I was kind of the CIA person and there was a federal judge and there was another person. But because it was the night before the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, that was the like, that's all anyone wanted to talk. About. Right. So we finish up. I come off the stage. It was very clear. I was a career CIA officer. A uh, bunch of people come up and ask questions, you know, like they do of us after our podcast, our live events. And um, there's a there's a Minnesota University of Minnesota student and his dad. His dad's like mid 70s. And the kid asks some good questions and I'm fine. It's all going well. And the dad walks up to me, gets right up in my face. And he says, you did it, didn't you? And I said, well, sir, if you mean the Kennedy assassination, I was 16 months old. So I'm pretty sure I wasn't involved. If you mean the CIA, Alex, to your earlier point, I don't think that happened simply because I don't think there's any way our government could ever keep that kind of a secret for half a century. And this guy, completely straight faced, said to me, well, you faked the moon landing. <laughs> There's yeah, just certain look, people you're never going to get through to. I, well, I know. I, yeah, I mean, look, who can believe in the 21st century and not amongst an un hitherto undiscovered tribe, but amongst people who walk among us in your country and in mine, flat earth is still a thing. And people oh, post it. Millions it, of people. But, yeah, what do they what do they think happens when you get to the edge? Like, why have none of them, if they've traveled, why have none of them been to and seen the edge? I mean, it seems the answer is obvious. <laughs> Haven't they been on cruise ships? None of them? Well, the answer is obvious. If you believe in flat earth, you just get all your flat earthers together and fly to the edge, and then then we'll know, won't we? We'll show, you'll have shown us. So um, there's an amazing documentary I might have talked about on the show before, too, which we'll put in the show notes. Uh, our pal James Carville told me about it. Yeah. And it is on Netflix. I can't remember the name of it. We'll put it in the notes. It is a entire two year following of the, and I'm not exaggerating, millions of people in the United States who are members right. of the Flat Earth Society. And without blowing the ending of the movie, they devise an experiment exactly along the lines of what you're saying that That's should right. have definitively answered the question. They conduct but the experiment it proves the earth is round and they're like, oh, something's wrong with our experiment. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the Egyptians figured out curvature of the other. Yeah. Anyway, and through, through no connection other than your, someone came up to me afterwards when I was giving a speech. I was giving a speech in The Hague around the time of our Brexit. I, I can't remember now if it was before or after the vote, but either way, temperatures, fever was high in yeah. certain areas. And, and I gave, I was received quite politely given I wanted my country to leave the European Union and I still think it was the right thing to do. Anyway, um, there were there was this group of people just sat scowling, shaking their heads at me. Turned out they were the foreign representatives to The Hague, who from different European countries, who had come so much to identify with the central institution they were at that they no longer they forgot their job was to uphold their national interest, which seems yeah. to have fought us all my national interest arguments completely held no sway with them. Anyway, the more amusing second. Um, uh, group of people that i noticed this there was a couple of quite you know well-to-do ladies uh came up after us and one, one of them said you know i you know, set out my views about the european union and what i thought was wrong and so forth and she was full of smiles and she said you know alex that was ever so entertaining but you can tell us now you don't really mean it do you <laughs> <laughs> you know, of not a nice boy like you. <laughs> you know, fifty-two percent of my country, my entire country, voted to leave the European Union. And it seemed but, like you, know, you were one of us. Yeah, I don't know exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. It seems to be turning out okay so far. At least the parade of horribles that was predicted is not uh, happening. As far as uh, we were going to have um, half a million unemployed, we we're going to have super gonorrhea. Uh, we were going to have plagues of locusts. The locusts would have super gonorrhea. Uh, yeah, so so far, so no plagues. You know, if there were any species that I would be okay with getting super gonorrhea, probably would be the locusts. locusts. No They're one quite tasty, them. though. I had them on a pizza in Mexico. It's pretty good. Garlic, little garlic butter saute them up. Yeah. They, hey. they, they, the crickets make a nice snack in a bowl, uh, heavily salted, yeah. um, tasty. But this is not a food show. 
Next. So we're going to wrap it up. Cheers, everybody. See you next Cheers. time. Cheers.